Good morning, afternoon. Hey, Catherine. Hey, Perkins. <laughs> you, want, you want to get your food? All right. This is, uh, I guess this is number 11 of these monthly Q&A, AMAs, whatever you want to call it. And I'm happy, to, you know, obviously I like to focus these on hex crawling, but I'm happy to talk about pretty much anything. So I guess I've been doing these for almost a year, which seems kind of crazy, but there it is. Let me get my screen set up here. All right, hold on a second. There we go. Uh, something just occurred to me as I wait for folks to chime in uh, is I was going to make a thing for it on my board here. On the big board. Let's get up on the big board, everybody. Where, are you going to let me grab onto that? Is that the title? Well, that's the title. Terrain as decision points. Something I've been thinking about lately. I've been thinking, as one does, as I do on occasion, I have been thinking about what are really the important things in not so much the hex crawling itself, the act of hex crawling, but in kind of our hex maps and sort of setting up our campaign. And I, I'm really coming to believe, I'm happy to be dissuaded. I am coming to believe that the geographical fidelity, whatever you want to call it, whether that's to some kind of human-like environment or whatever else, is, I guess, really the only one we really have. I suppose some of us might be versed in the uh, well, I don't know, exogeography or cosmic geography or geography of other planets, something like that. But I'm starting to think that those that geographical, that part of it, Ge the actual geography is probably the least important part, all things considered. Now, sure, things we want that to make sense. We want the, the everyone to be able to get on the same page and kind of have an understanding of what's where and why. But I think we all have that. We all share that to a degree that is pretty basic in terms of what's actually going on in 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 nature, in our environments. I think we roughly have ideas of, okay, this is what it's like to live in a Whatever, wherever we are, if, if, we, if you live in a temperate region, that's where you have a lot of your experience. You're going to say, okay, that's great. Or you're going to live in another place and have other experiences. I, I've never lived in some place, say, like the Indian subcontinent that has fairly different weather and, and seasonal kind of variations than, um, than, say, where I am in the northeast U.S. That's That's fine. And we want the geography to kind of make sense. Sure, we don't want, we want, you know, coastlines and everything okay mountains high altitude coastlines low altitude we don't want the sea floating above the the, the mountain tops and that sort of thing unless we do but we, we might we don't generally uh want that kind of stuff hey Krista, yeah welcome yeah it has been a while since i've seen you so welcome welcome back aboard but i think that once you get past there that kind of uh, okay it makes common sense okay right the, the at the sea is where we anticipate there should be a sea we follow rivers they lead to the sea great uh, we follow, we go against the rivers. We're going to end up in higher altitudes. Great. Snow-capped mountains, down hills, whatsoever going down, right? Okay. And uh, we're not going from the desert straight to the tundra and vice versa because of temperature and all that. We get that, right? The, the frigid places, the hot places, and there's going to be kind of warmish, warmish places, a whole kind of spectrum in between them. Great. But I, but that all that stuff is super basic and you can do so much with it. I think really beyond that, I, I really think that it's just not very important. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter very much. I don't think anybody cares. And this is what I always find frustrating when you end up in the cart cartographical, the map making communities, in, at least in terms of for games, I would even probably say this for books too, to be honest, but it, you know, at least for say for your tabletop role playing games, We'll start harping on things like your splitting of rivers, things like all these things that actually do exist. They're not the main way things happen on Earth, but rivers do split. All these kind of things do happen in occasion, and there's no reason why in a planet or some kind of who knows if it's even a planet shape and a plane that's been literally shaped by magic, these things couldn't exist. But I really think that if the less time you waste on trying to meet whatever you find those are, the better, because I don't think they matter. And certainly from a gaming standpoint. I really think they don't matter. And probably the other thing I think that's maybe related to this as I'm spending a long time is that when you go with these huge maps and I see them all the time, maybe I'll go on a Reddit where you can find them. People will put out these maps and there's just oodles and oodles of terrain. In fact, let me see if I can find one. I know I've got, there's a hex crawling. 
I'm not trying to pick on anybody because it's certainly definitely not my intent, but just to kind of show something, if I can find one. Now, that's a whole bunch of stuff that I've put in. That's not it. Let's see, new. Oh, okay, this one, that's definitely not where we want to go. Oh, is there a hex crawl? I thought there was a hex crawling. There is. Oh, let's see. So maybe does this one work? Mm, well, one, this is 2,000 two hexes of Hyboria. Uh, that's a lot. All right, I'm trying to find one. I know I've seen them, and now I'm going to try to find them, and I can't. Oh, this one's pretty okay. God, maybe it was, I don't know where it was. Where it was just, man. So let me go back to OSR subreddit and see if I can find it there. Hey, Ian. My point being, as I'm rambling around trying to find this, is that when you end up in a situation in which you have just a, a, a gazillion hexes, oftentimes I've noticed that those hexes tend to be of the same type. So you're going to have, uh, oh, this is just forest, and it's forest for days, and then it's grasslands for days, and it's all these things. And then, of course, that puts a lot of pressure. Pressure in, in many, many different areas, right? Pressure on you as a content creator in the content creation world builder portion of your GM duties. Maybe this is it. This one might work. I think this might be it. Okay, yes, yeah, so this is a good... Oh, this is the one we've looked at. I've... <laughs> I've used this one before. In fact, I think this is in my chart. So I went around way to look at one I've already looked at. So we're looking at this map. And I'm pretty sure this is the one that I've grabbed in the past. Am I wrong about that? Am I right? I'm pretty sure I have that down here. Yes, I did. There's our old friends, Judd and Mewin. All right, so I don't even need to go there. So we're looking at this map, right? And I've used this for multiple different purposes. But I, I think there's one of the things here is just look at the oodles of space. On the one hand, that makes us feel good, right? We're creating a vastness. I think a lot of us as GMs, we want vastness or we want our world to feel big. We don't want it to feel like you're on a little, a tiny little playground. We don't feel like you have the whole park, the whole city, the whole state, the whole continent, everything to deal with. So we, we just open up everything, super vast spaces. But then the problem comes, oh, here's my starting area and I'm doing a sandbox. So I'm gonna be leaving it open. And maybe I'm going to have, um, I don't know if this is, we can, uh, let's just say this is a, a not a player facing map. So they're not actually seeing this, but we maybe we'll put some, uh, I like to give folks a couple of different, a couple of different things here. I want to give them some, eh, maybe a plot hook over to this place over here. Maybe a plot hook, this place over here, maybe one over here, or I don't know, or maybe one over here because I want to just. Thinking I want to spread them out. Let's say they're going to start in me wins our home base. And then we're going to have uh, maybe this one. We'll say, here's one. Here's another. Here was one over here. And one of these over here maybe has something. So we got some spaces. Let's spread up across our map area. So the party could go anywhere. Now, I can set up my tables. I can set up my stuff and be fine. But there's an additional question. Once you get into these areas you're in this vast open grasslands maybe you're moving quickly i don't know how big these are supposed to be we could say these are six mile hexes so maybe you can move through three of these a day maybe we'll be generous we can be generous uh yeah in, in inspo rpg points out the scale matters yes hey rpg grandma yep scale definitely doesn't matter we'll just say these are six mile hexes i mean i can pull up examples i'm sure where they've said it this one just doesn't but the when I'm talking about conceptual, I think it doesn't matter really. You're, the scale is less important than I think. Well, let me get into what I'm going to say. Is when you are in the in somewhere out in here, let's just we'll zoom in here. You're in 2018. What decision points do you have? Just looking at it, it's just grasslands. We haven't really populated this with everything, right? You don't really have any decision points because this is grasslands. It's either we keep going the way we're going. Assuming we don't know, assuming that whatever direction we want to go in, we hasn't hasn't occurred to us that we've gone horribly wrong and we should be going another direction. There's no choice here. You're just well, keep going straight. Keep going straight. And so a lot of GMs will get stuck. Oh, okay, you've entered the grasslands. Keep going straight. Oh, you've entered more grasslands. Keep going straight. More grasslands. Keep going straight. More grasslands. Did you did I stutter? Keep 
going straight. There's no decisions here. It's not fun for the players or there's nothing really intriguing. There's nothing to say. Now, yes, we can get into, oh, we could put stuff in there, all this stuff. That's fine. But my point is, is that these terrain, as it is, you end up with a lot of spaces. Look at all this over here, all this forest down here, all, all these mountains where there really is a minimal of decision making. Once you're in it, once you're in it, assuming you haven't filled this up with stuff, there's nothing to do. It's just go straight. And I think a lot of folks get caught up in that. They're either they're asking like every hex, like, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And the party has nothing to do. Well, we're going to keep going straight. I mean, what else is there to do? Either we know, uh, we assume that either we're in this plains, we're going to hit the Red River and Lomende, the town of Lomende or Castle Keep, whatever city of Lomende eventually, or I guess we're not. But until we actually get to a point where we're sure we're not going to hit the Red River, you know, like, like we all of a sudden we veer down here, and we find ourselves in the woods or at the borders of the woods. We, we might go, okay, wait a minute, something's gone wrong. Or we end up, hey, you've, you, you're, you're, you're back at me when, okay, maybe something else has gone wrong, but there's nothing to do. It's just keep going. And so I've, I've come to this concept of, and I see this in kind of the stuff that I like, is having a lot of different terrain because once you start hitting different terrain, it gives you different choices. You're, you know, and this is this ends up, and I've, I've been noticing in my game, this is what happens. The party's going off in the plains, and they'll go, and then they'll hit some woods. Now suddenly it's okay, you've come up against some forest. What do you do, right? Because now we have a decision point. Ooh, forest. Do we Should we go around the forest? Should we go in the forest? Is the forest the way we should be going? Oh, we don't know, but that's a decision point. Oh, we're, we're rendering some hills. Okay, hill country. Is this what we're expecting? Hill country is more dangerous. Hill country is harder to traverse. Again, should we go around? Should we try to find something else? All those changes in terrain, when you're, you're, you're seeing little changes, they, they all prompt the party to make decisions because they show things changing. Whereas I think when you have these great swaths of the same terrain, no matter what terrain it is, no matter how complicated and how how much you do with it, eventually it's just the same thing. The first time you enter a hex and you're in some kind of, that you're in the, what was the, in the a Princess Bride, the, um, what was the name of the, the fire swamp? First time you enter a fire swamp hex, oh, uh, you know, you got the this and that, the RUS is all that stuff. And once you figured it out, now you're on the hex two, your hex three. It's not, it's not a challenge anymore. It's not new and interesting. It's just the same old hex. Uh, let's see, we got some stuff in the in the chat here. Ian says, okay, GM, what's to the north? You see grassy plains. Well, what's to the south? Grassy plains. East, grassy plains expand far to the east. Well, what about west? Yeah, grassy plains. <laughs> right. And so I think that succumbing to this this idea of we got to make this thing you know in other words look at this huge map we got all these locations all this stuff but and i know that now here's what i'll say i don't find just for me that like the three hexes like chicago chicago whizzes hey just have three hexes i don't find that's enough because i want to know if you're in hex here i want to know what's out here what can i see i don't i don't i don't want it to be just you know staring out into the void or some kind of fog hammers you in but at the same time this is, I, I just find it's way too much. Way too much for me to want to manage, way too much for me to get in there, and the distances are far. And I think especially when you're starting out, okay, if you're, you're they're low level, you don't need, you can deal with local challenges. I kind of feel like maybe, maybe this kind of size, which I think is when I put up that one, like maybe two hexes, a two hex radius around your spot so you can reasonably kind of see everything and go, then... I feel like that's good. And then you just stick with some local challenges. I'm not saying if you if you just have your mindset, you have this whole concept of this Red River area, don't, you know, don't build it all out. Maybe at that point, it's like, well, where can we put the party with the most amount of bang for buck? Like right here, Dorlo is pretty interesting. Granted, you got the grasslands and there's nothing here, but you got the ruin, you've got the river, which is interesting. So you got a couple of things here. Uh, Lomende is just in this island. Like you got to get so far just out before you start hitting anything. I, I guess maybe not if you go this way. But really, that kind of I, maybe I should call it the uh, what, what would it be like the the like the myth of the myth of expansiveness or something. I don't know. There's probably a clever name I could come up with for what what it means. RPG Grandma says, this is where you describe unique creatures, unique flora, interesting features, maybe glimpses of other people who avoid them, resource needs, tracks of previous travelers, random graves, destroyed merchant wagons. Oh, no, absolutely. That stuff is all awesome. But here's the, not the problem, but the difficulty. When you're given so much area to have to fill, 
there's that daunting part of it, right? I, I guess maybe here's where, where, where it comes down to it. Yes, all that stuff is great, right? Come up with what's on all these hexes, uh, all these things going on. But that requires you to put in a lot of work. And I think it's when you, it's that puzzle of, okay, we want to put in work that's good for us. We want to put in work that is going to be worthwhile for a long time. And we want to put on work that we can kind of reuse. And this this stuff matches all those things. But I think we also want to be, I guess maybe the one I really is, we want to put in work that's manageable. And given this kind of area, if you're someone who feels the need to try to fill in all the blanks, it becomes less and less manageable. And I think sometimes that's where folks get caught up is you look at these massive hex maps and you think this is too daunting for me. I can't. I can't handle all this stuff, or it feels like it's like a monster corridor because you're getting out in these empty spaces and there's nothing. And you're like, boring, right? Oh, we're, we're way out here, boring kind of thing. Or, oh my gosh, you're going to be out here and now I have to fill up just in this area, which is not even that much of my map. I got to try to fill in all this stuff. And granted, you can build tables and you can do all kinds of stuff. But I think sometimes, and I, I, I was probably have a whole video on this. I, I feel like sometimes we embrace randomness too much, which is weird because I love tables and things, but I feel like so there's some areas where maybe some care or some like not being random works. And I feel like this kind of stuff, it some or maybe setting up your tables, which is again more of that kind of work to do the work. Set up your tables to get the tables you want so you get the results you want. But it's a lot of bears. And I feel like a lot of it can be kind of averted if you just start with a smaller size and not get caught up. In it, and instead of saying, "Well, I want to have," because I think part of the thing is, especially in the sort of fantasy, fantasy realm, like everything's huge. Forests are giant. Mountain ranges are touching the outer space. Uh, everything is massive, and so you feel like, "Oh, I got to have this massive scale." Whereas I think almost real all the way back, and maybe not three hexes like the like the Chicago Wiz thing, but eight, twelve hexes, something like that. <coughs> hey, Brian Smith. Porker says, left pre-prepared content can work best, so in-game can be flexible. Yes, though I think what can happen, if you're not careful, is you can end up with a mess. You can end up with uh, something that just doesn't, ha doesn't cohere. Uh, you know, you're out here on the grassy plains, and you're kind of throwing up all kinds of stuff, but it just it doesn't make sense with each other because you didn't connect things together well enough. Which is why I think that the less area you give yourself to potentially prep is better because you can think about it more. If you if you have a whole bunch of areas, so you have to rely on little, really random tables, not your own customized tables, but just you know you're gonna you're gonna open up Tome, Tome of Adventure Design and start rolling dice on tables. You'll end up with a bunch of stuff, it can, but then can it be really difficult, if not impossible, to put it all together. And so, well, what is the world like? How does the world come in handy? How are I come in handy? How does the world come together and to form some kind of coherent whole that we can all understand? Because I'm getting this over here and then this hex is this over here and, and I'm starting to put it together and we're starting to move around and it's stuff's just starting to kind of unravel on me as things no longer, no longer make sense, which I think can happen sometimes sooner rather than later, which I, I guess I feel like in another, I guess another point just in general is that kind of having your world in mind, like having that setting of what, which is another good reason why you want to prep your tables and stuff is have the world in your brain somehow that, okay, I know what my world is. And that way, when you're rolling on things and you're putting things together, you know what your world is. You can pick and choose. This fits, this doesn't fit, or this is how I have to tweak this thing to fit or not fit, which I think also helps, again, when you're working with a small area. It doesn't put as much pressure. I think that maybe that's the, if I had to pick one thing, it's, it's you don't want too much pressure to fall on any one particular area of prep or thing. And when you start dealing with tons of hexes, even though you, you, you think this is amazing and this is what you want, you're putting pressure on a lot of things that can then fail. Just like in machinery, if you put too much pressure on one particular point, it can fail. And I think that can happen with your world building and with your GMing, it starts to fail. And then things just kind of start to fall, fall apart in a bit. But kind of getting back to what I was saying at the beginning, when you give yourself different terrains to deal with. I think it's good for the party. It's good for you because you don't exhaust yourself. I'm here in, I don't know how many hexes of grasslands. Not only do I have to try to, I want to put stuff around them with grasslands, but it's all grasslands. Now, granted, I could try to start differentiating between what kind of grasslands are these versus these and all kinds of little things, but it's a lot. 
But if I come down to an area over, say, over here, where I've got some grasslands, I've got some forested hills, I've got some forests, I've got some savanna, I've got a little bit of mountainous forest in the mountains, suddenly, going back to that exhaustion point, I'm not going to exhaust myself I just, if I'm coming up with three or six. Let's say I want to, let's say this is, I don't know what this is supposed to be, maybe it's some tower, but let's just say this is their home base, whatever. If I'm circle a radius around here, each one of these terrains maybe has four to eight hexes of it. And to me, that's a lot more manageable to say, hey, you don't have to create 30 hexes of grasslands, even if it's over multiple sessions. You just got to come up with, uh, just come up with three or four. Just come up with uh, three or four savanna hexes. Just come up with three or four forest hexes. Maybe this one's the hardest one because they're all kind of forest, but I feel like forest with hills and then these sort of mountains. And then if you want to include some mountains in there, I think that's a lot more manageable. And having all those different terrains, I think is good for you as a GM because it, again, does put pressure on any one thing. You can come up with different things. It's, it's easier to come up with, okay, here's a grassland challenge. I just want to find one or two of those and one or two forest ones and one or two, say, lowland, but sort of hilly forest, one or two upland, highland forests, and then a couple of mountain ones. So I found I feel like I gravitate more now towards not having mass chunks of big terrain, but having multiple. And if I am going to have a big woods, then have something like this, where you can kind of differentiate some different woods. So we kind of have woods and the sort of valley areas, woods, lowland woods, highland woods, and then some kind of mountainous, mountainous woods. RBG Grandma says, sometimes just picking ideas off tables is more helpful. This way you avoid it uh, not making sense. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Ryan Smith says, the process of play can kind of inject meaning, right? The players can find meaning in the weirdest of things. Sure, they certainly can. I, I think what, ends up, what, what can happen, I'm not saying this has to happen or that's inevitable. But what can happen is that uh, event, it can get to a point where you can't, you're going to, they'll make sense of a few things. And then some more stuff gets piled on. And it can, so there are a couple of things. It can be confusion, right? Because who, so one of the things also is when you're dealing with this kind of space, you have certain things that are important. For example, you're in MeWin. These are our important things. <clears throat> but they're far away. These things are far. They're going to have a fair amount of traveling. If they go in a straight line, if they manage to navigate really straight on so we got they got one two three four five six hexes of terrain I'm gonna zoom in here so this is at least a couple of days I would say right a couple of days travel now we want to fill all this stuff in right we want to fill all these things in and this isn't necessarily even a problem okay necessarily fill all this stuff in unless we're paying attention it's very easy to lose track of the fact for us and the party that we what we were trying to get here. Oh, you've got a there was a a wagon that's burned. Find a burning wagon in here. Oh, really? Oh, what was this? Let's figure out what that is. Oh, there's uh, this was an old hunting hunting uh, cabin or something. Hunting hunter's shack, and it looks like something devious has happened here. Oh, there was a lair over here. Oh, there was a a uh, party of goblins and it seems like the goblins seem to have come from this direction so we're okay there's all these things right and that you can lose that focus now in some campaigns it's gonna be fine and in, in my home campaign hey great they want to go chasing after goblins and that's fine but i'm very happy to just improv stuff and go with that flow but for other people you're gonna be like no really i wanted you to get i really wanted you to get down to 16 i think that's yeah 1622 to this camp and then on to the dungeon. That's really, and maybe even the party, that's really what they wanted to do. But even the party can get confused because you're not necessarily linking these together if that's your intention because you're doing it on the fly. Now you could think about it and say, okay, I'm going to link them together. And, I'll, and I've talked about doing that in my own game, which is a good, I think can be a good trick is, okay, you run across a burned up merchant wagon here. How can it possibly relate to the camp? Let's just assume this is a camp of bad guys, of bandits. I mean, they're as a bandit camp, it's probably not ideally placed anywhere. I mean, you're nowhere near any kind of roads. 
presuming there's roads from Jude to me when they're not running down towards the bandit camps. This is a really poor location for a bandit camp, if that's what it is. But maybe this is a maybe this is more of a religious. I'm, I'm trying to see what that is. That might be standing stones rather than a camp. I'm not sure. So maybe this is something else. But whatever it is, if we're not on the point and kind of right connecting these through a lot of confusion confusion on the players part confusion on our part it can be hard to make sense of what really is important we started off thinking this thing here where it was important and now there's all this other stuff that's kind of mucking up the works i've told this story before i was playing in a campaign I, we didn't get very far but it was the first couple of sessions of a i think it was an into the odd slash bastion bastion land campaign and we were just trying to get from that we were given a task or we ended up going to the job board and getting the task to clean out something in the sewers. Something was going on in the sewers you need to check out. And we we're going to the sewers. And every block, something was happening. And at one point, I got kind of frustrated because I was like, man, I think at the end of like the first session, the GM was like, hey, like, what are you guys thinking so far? And I was like, you know, this is cool. And I'm sort of enjoying a little bit into the eye. But man, I just want to get to the adventure location. And like, I don't care. Like all this stuff was happening and it was supposed to be kind of fun. And it was... Uh, you know, it's kind of gonzo, which isn't necessarily my bag anyway. It was like, oh, this stuff's happened. This does happen. All this stuff's happening. I'm like, I just want to get to the adventuring area. I don't care about this stuff, but I feel like the GM is putting in front of us like we should deal with it. Like, oh, this truck collapsed in the road and it's spilling treacle around the street. And I'm like, I just want to go around it, you know, but it seems like you're being prompted that this is something important. Right, you know, oh, this is this is it's almost like when we were uh what were we reading through the other day and, and someone was saying and they don't like the blocks of text, right? Big blocks of text on the page because it's you have to scan through, you can't see what's important. And the same thing can happen here. You have these big blocks of terrain, and when you're filling it all with stuff and you're thinking, Great, I'm filling it all with stuff, this is gonna be awesome. Then what can happen is you lose the importance of what you're trying to do. <clears throat> if you're not careful, you can you can be on top of it and be like, Yeah, I'm gonna keep. I'm going to keep bringing it back, bringing it back, bringing it back. But if you don't, or you forget, or you're even your party sometimes, then you're going to get caught up in here. Like I said, some campaigns, my home campaign, not a problem. I will let them wander along. But I've also sometimes they've forgotten. They're like, what are we supposed to be doing? And I'll say, oh, yeah, here's, here's here are the things that are going on. I could probably be more efficient. But my thing is it seems like everyone's having fun, and I'm having fun. And the, the main, there's I don't have a main plot that's waiting for them. It's just things that are happening in the world. So whether they get to them or not, it's kind of all good in my book, but I do recognize that for a lot of folks is even in kind of a sandbox thing is you kind of want folks to get, and the party may want to. I mean, I think that's the other thing is forgetting what me as a GM or you as a GM. Well, a lot of times your party wants to get there. And sometimes like with me in that into the odd uh, electric bastion land, bastion land campaign, I wanted to make progress and I was being frustrated because the GM was trying to do the equivalent of filling all these things with stuff in a way that was obfuscating what I felt like was what we wanted to do. I wanted to investigate the sewers. I want to get to this camp or get to the camp and get to the cave. And all this stuff's doing is it's like you're throwing down obstacles in front of me. And I'm like, Hey man, like, I don't, I just want to get, I just want to get to where we're going. Right. And that can, you know, that can be an issue. Now, of course, so look at it here. What, what if you just took this, if I could cut this out and just push it all closer to me win. And instead of having, four hexes of woods i've got a hex of fields which i think is good hex of woods which is good and then that maybe one hex of hills and woods and then here and then maybe this gets pushed up and these are in two hexes given it was assuming these are six mile hexes you still have tons of stuff in here it's not like you enter this hex and you're all of a sudden at the you're at the site and then you cross a little un, a boundary line and suddenly the cave is like it's you know these, these icons are not to scale i mean there's plenty of room to maneuver around so just push all this stuff up what have you lost nothing really you haven't lost anything but now you've i mean one if if there are kinds of if you have tensions right let's say we have ticking clocks something's in this cave that's gonna go bad it's like well this cave is out in the middle of freaking nowhere if it goes bad it's it's got to go a long way before it gets to the nearest the nearest area that's that's got to go a ways but now take this cave and push it right up next to me when if the cave was right here, suddenly that thing breaks out. It's a lot more of a problem. It's a lot more pressing. It, it adds that tension. It's it's close. I know we want everything to feel far away, but I still think you can kind of get that vastness of space, I think, and not give yourself 
a literal vastness of space that doesn't really have much of a payoff. Maybe, you know, I guess maybe I would say that. You have all the space out there. What's the payoff for having all the space? You can add it all later. I'm not suggesting that you never add on to it. You know, at the end of your campaign, if you play for a year or so, maybe you have filled out this entire huge grid, but there's don't really need to. If you just want to have all this stuff here to have it, that's I guess that's okay, but you don't really need it. Stick with this. I mean, look how much, look at how, I mean, how big, just to put this in perspective, how big does the city of Miwin have to be that it requires one, two, let's just, just cutting around it. We're talking 30 some odd square miles, 60, 90, 120 ish, 180 ish, 240 ish, 30 ish. I don't know. Or 32 ish, 36 ish. I mean, this is like, no, or 360 some odd square miles of farmland. I mean, that's a lot, right? There are 30 some odd square miles in here. Just one or two of these is probably enough. I mean, this is a whole lot of farmland. Not even killing you know, Look at Jude. There's rock and a whole bunch of farmland as well. Um, there's a lot. Catherine says 12 miles in medieval times can feel like a world away. Yeah, I mean, it can feel like a world away for me. I mean, I'm in Brooklyn, in New York City. There are weeks I don't go 12 miles from anywhere. That we're like a mile here, a mile back. I mean, I'm not even, this is not, I'm, you know, I'm not taking the subway anywhere. I'm staying in my neighborhood. Our grocery store is a couple blocks away. Maybe I go a mile to another grocery store, more big box grocery store. Maybe I come back. I mean, there's, a, you know, if I plot out 12 miles away from me, uh, it's quite a distance places I'm not even going to, you know, yeah, let alone in this kind of medieval world. So you don't need all this space, save it, save it for when you kind of, you know, when you sort of need it. And then you can have a more interesting, interesting geography. And and I don't like, and you know, if someone wants to say, well, you know, the great plains or some other, you know, I, I get it. There, there are areas with massive forests and massive deserts and massive things. And you can have those too, but you're, you know, you're raising things up. I mean, you go into the Sahara and I've only been to the kind of the edges of Sahara, but you get in that Sahara in the, in the desert. And part of the whole point is that you're going to get in there. You're not going to be able to tell anything from anything. Uh, dunes. What's the other side? Dunes. I and mean, that's the parts that makes it super challenging just in reality, but it's also very challenging to run. I'm not saying you can't run it. I'm not saying you can't run this. I could run this game as is, but it's putting a lot of pressure on me to fill, especially in these kind of grassland areas when you're presuming this is about as fast as you're going to be able to go. So if I'm going 18 miles a day in your best conditions, there's a lot of hexes we're going to be churning through in a day. And if I've decided that my approach is one landmark for hex, then, and I'm looking at it, it's like, oh, how far could they get in a day? I got to put a big radius of stuff. So the amount of stuff I need to come up with, given the possibility of if here they are in 1114, and in any minute they could decide to go to Palin and go across this bridge, or they could decide to go down to Jude, or they could decide to go to Mewen, or they could keep going. I mean, I got to fill in a lot of area. And then those other things come in, right? So I guess I'm just saying, you know, I like varying up the terrain because it doesn't put pressure on my creativity for all the same to, to deal with sameness. And that's just not sameness in generation it's also sameness in description how how many different ways like, am i might be able to talk about grasslands before i'm just saying it's more grasslands maybe for the first couple of hexes i'm like oh this that no this all that but i'm not a i'm not a knowledgeable ecologist on grasslands i don't know much about them i'm only going to be saying with well, tall grasses or whatever it is and then yeah there's more tall grasses what's over there yeah it's more tall grasses more tall grasses so save, why don't I save myself in trouble? But if I'm going from grasslands to forests, to some hills, to some swamps, to this river, to a valley, to a, you know, there's some kind of uh, cliffs, everything, then it's like, oh, I got all these different things to play with. So I think like, you know, give yourself, give yourself all the ammunition you can, right? Give yourself all the tools and tips and tricks you can. And part of that, I think for me anyway, is varying up that terrain. If you want to do it on a subhex level, zoom in on one of these and plug a whole bunch of different stuff in there. If you feel like that helps, then, you know, that's another thing you can do too. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me see what's in the, going on in the chat. Ian says, if your average farmer can't get to the next village before nightfall, then your scale between locations is too high unless your intention is to create isolated communities. Yeah, now, I yeah, I don't know what the, um, 
that's a good point. And I don't know what the, I, I mean, this is just a, someone posted this. I don't know what their co uh, context is, but I would presume at least if this was my map, th this whole, these would all be littered with multiple villages. This would be like, this would be a whole, I don't know, area, like a, a I don't know, a county or a something like this is all villages, 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 all villages up through it here with roads that just are going. I probably would have dr drawn some road coming from Jude up through here. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what, like what in terms of what does Jude do? Is there hills or something here that they're, I don't know what's obviously there's some good, all these grasslands, I guess are fairly good quality. Cause one of the things with the great, Plains or, the, or grasslands. So what I was reading as I went working on my kind of hex crawl tools, and and again, this is a very simplistic understanding, is that grasslands don't have deep wells of water. That's where you get the trees. It's deep, like really good water, kind of deep water. I don't know. There's a lot of water, and it's kind of runs deep. Whereas grasslands are when you when you start getting dominated by grasslands it's where you don't have that depth the roots and everything can't go it's i don't know if it's more rocky or whatever's going on there there you you don't have that the plants cannot penetrate as deeply into the ground at least in most places that's where you get grasslands on grasslands i don't think just on their own are really as good farming as cutting down forests but you can use different ways of you know you can you can get that up there so even though like they're kind of in like a lot of places the bread basket like for us all the Midwest law farming is in the kind of the Great Plains area. It's not really, I don't think it's because naturally the Great Plains are the best place to farm other than maybe just being flat for the most part, but that kind of thing. So I don't know what's going on here at Jude, how they got this little pocket of, I guess, excellent farming. Maybe it was originally forest that they cut down. I mean, there's probably stories you could make, but in any case, there would be all kinds of villages here and all kinds of villages here. Um, Ryan Smith says, do big stretches of the same terrain add anything? I think a lot of people sort terrain types and map makers into the woods, the mountains, the fields, et cetera. I don't think they do. I don't, I don't, that's, I guess that's prime really what I'm talking about. I don't think they do add anything but more work. I think what they do though is in our minds, we have this idea of it's vast, the vastness. And we want to say that, right? Because that's like fantasy. Everything is big. Everything is giant. Everything is, there's nothing small. So people don't want to talk about the small wood. Everyone wants the great wood, you know, the, the, the giant swamp. You know the 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 massive mountains of dragon's teeth, like and, and that's cool. Right? Everyone's done that. Everyone's had their dragon's teeth mountains, and wasn't that Dragon Lance had the dragon teeth mountains, or maybe I don't know, maybe it's in one of the Mistar. I don't know which one has it, but everyone's got those kinds of humongous mountains. And every, I just think we just get in this fact that we want everything to be huge, but there's a price to be paid that we might not always realize. And I think as someone may have posted up high, the map makers make it super easy. Yeah. You go to worldographer and you can generate a whole, a whole planet and a click of a button. And then it's kind of hard to then scale it back. I do wish that worldographer had an option where you could start kind of zoomed in really local, small, and then build outwards. I mean, I get why that makes it more difficult because I love the fact that you can go to those different levels. Oh, start off on the on the, like the world level, then go to continent, then go to kingdom, then go to province. I love that. But I think it the you know the way it works there is you start on the higher level, and when it drills down, it takes the your overlying terrain, and then it kind of scrambles it up and gives you sort of what the under an idea of what the underlying terrain is, and then expands it going down. You, just, you can't really do that going back the other way, but it kind of puts you in a, if you're not disciplined with yourself and say, okay, I've generated this, this, I'm pretty sure this is worldographer, a worldographer map. I mean, judging by the icons and everything. So now that you've created this whole thing, now to have the discipline to say, okay, I'm either going to fix this up or I'm going to do it. It can be, it can be hard. And I think it's, there's not a lot of, I mean, there is like the, I want to say there's not a lot, maybe I should say that it's just, you end up on your own doing this stuff unless you seek out stuff like my content or other folks' content who and people are putting out a lot of stuff on it, but it can be hard if you don't see that stuff to think like you get into worldographer and you create some 30 by 40 grid of hexes and now you're like, great, now I just need to fill all of this in. And then it's maybe I shouldn't do this territory. <laughs> Ian says that here's the small wood, small wood, war, eh, here's the small wood has a hidden cache of fairy gold. I believe it. Ryan Smith says, bigger is better. That's what America told me. Yeah, that's, that is what America says. Absolutely. I'm just going to scroll back through and see if I missed. I bet your grandma, yeah, talking about that farmland. Yeah, lots of villages. I mean, you can use this stuff for world building, right? I mean, that's one of the fun things. You'll see something, something like Worldographer or some other random thing will do where they'll put like, oh, there just happens to be a volcano right here. 
And all of a sudden you're going, Ooh, that's interesting. Like, what does that mean? And you can have some, you know, you can have some fun with that stuff, but it can be hard when it, it they, the, the tools kind of push you. I, I guess that's one thing that hex kit doesn't do because it, I, I believe it's default sizes are fairly small. doesn't push you to having a, 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 a massive, a massive um, map. Anyone have any folks have any questions or anything? Uh, oh, Brian Smith likes that bandit cap. That a uh, bandit cap that succeeds against all odds. The under the underdog tale of the band bandit camp. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. I, it's funny that I keep going back to this map, and then I tried to find another map, and I ended up on the same map. Like that Mool Forest. It's just humongous. It's huge. I mean, like granted, we have areas like I don't know what this the. I don't know to compare this to say the Pacific Northwest is a massive forest we have, and we do have these huge forests. But I think that's one of the things, right? And going back to what I was saying early on about the sort of geographical fidelity, why I don't care, is that the tensions in something like the Pacific Northwest, like if you think about, uh, oh, what was that guy? DB, what was his name? DB Cooper. This famous tale of DB Cooper, this guy who apparently, or he didn't apparently, he uh hijacked a plane got a bunch of money and then dropped out of the plane and disappeared in the pacific northwest and it's been a mystery ever since what happened to the guy did he survive did he did he crash? all this stuff and part of the tension of the story is that the pacific northwest those woodlands are so vast they're so huge that you could have somebody disappear in there apparently planes have disappeared in there all kinds of stuff disappears in there bigfoot's hanging around in there that nobody's being able to track down all this stuff's happening because right? it's so vast and that's an interesting tension in those kinds of stories that you can be in just miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of woods and really not have much uh, navigation in no way and that's kind of that's an interesting tension but from a game standpoint that's not what you want because that's not fun <laughs> if there's nothing there miles and miles and miles and miles of nothing it's not fun. It can, it, you can, once you, maybe you get to a point in which you have tools and things where that's not, it's just not fun. So I get where someone might be saying, yeah, but I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and that has thousands of miles of nothing but woods. It's like, great. Does that sound fun to you to play in thousands of miles, but nothing but woods, no encounters, no nothing. The worst things you're getting at the night are knocks from, you know, wood knocks from theoretical Bigfoot or hearing a wolf. And maybe you see a deer every couple of days. There's nothing there. It's that kind of vastness, almost like it's a desert on, in the trees. Does that seem fun to you? If maybe if you're playing the Bear Grylls tabletop role playing game, sure. If you're playing a fantasy RPG, maybe not. And so I'm not going to care about that, right? That becomes very unimportant to me. And this is a swig of uh, slightly warm, not English breakfast, some kind of black tea with milk for the working man. Imspo RPG says, don't grasslands have stuff like nomad, nomad tribes, ancient ruined shrines, rock outcroppings that hide sturges nests, ankh ank pits, or winding roads? Why is the sentiment that it has to be nothing? It doesn't have to be nothing. I'm not saying it has to be nothing, but I'm saying is what I'm saying is Imspo, that that puts a lot of pressure on you to come up with a whole bunch of stuff for all these hexes. And it's fine if you just got a couple, at least at one time. It's maybe not so fine for you, or everything is relative. If you got the thing to do it, but then you're, again, you're coming up with a whole bunch. And even then, if I were to take all your suggestions and put them into each one of these hexes, I'm only going to have this many hexes filled. And kegs, check. This, check, check, check. Winding roads, that's not really much of a feature. Check, check, check. Like, that's not that many. And yet I still have 50 or 60 left to go. How long before I run out of juice? Double, triple the amount of entries you have. It's like, great, now I got this much done. I still have all of this. So what I'm going to either doing is end up Creating variations on that. Okay, more ant kegs. Okay, more, more rock outcroppings. Okay, how many rock outcroppings do I want? I'm going to start going, me, myself, as a GM, even my, my party's name experience, I'm going, I don't, how many more rock croppings can, can I have? All right, what else do I got? I, I'm not sure. All right, I don't want any more ant kegs. Uh, what else do I got? Oh, giant termites. All right, it's kind of similar to ant kegs for sure. Okay, now now what? Oh, uh, gophers, giant gophers. All right, uh, regular gophers. Okay, uh, massive alien-sized ant kegs. Uh, okay, uh, no Fausto. Not run out of not run out of Jewish folk. Can't and ever have too few too many Jewish folk. Running out of juice. J U I C E. Juice. 
Juice. Ian says, Giant Forest are probably a great situation to build at a table with generation tables with a stock of prefab dungeons drop in. Yes, I mean, if you have stuff to drop in there, absolutely. I mean, that's the whole thing. I'm not saying that you can't do it. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm not saying any of that. And I'm not saying it should be blank. But what I am saying is you're, what are the pressures you're putting on yourself? <laughs> no, no, no problems, Fausto. Uh, what are the pressures you're putting on, putting on yourself, right? What, 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 where are you leading yourself to have to go like, man, this is tough because like all the challenges and everything else, the problem is, is that everything, you know, it's that you got to kind of know yourself too. Some folks are going to be great at doing all this and then somewhere else they're going to fall down. You go, well, don't. And what I'm, I, what I'm trying to say is if you don't have to, don't put that pressure on yourself, alleviate the pressure, make it easy. Cause when you give yourself a few, then over time, sure. You can build it out, build it out, build it out. But then sometimes you get up a spot. Like I've decided just to hand myself a, a huge, a huge task. Right. And, and it's like, why, why am I handing myself this huge task? Why am I putting like, again, going back here? Yes, fine. I can do this, but why am I doing this? Why am I putting it? Why does this have to be how, you know, what 30, 60, nine, you know, 120 square miles of forest or even more, I guess, between here, what difference does it make? What is it? You know, am I trying to say something with that? Uh, maybe I want to say this is super remote and this is part of the story of that. I guess that's fine. That go for it. But why, why not just say, yeah, it's right here. And then this is right next to, you know, push these up. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, B, I, I, if you're going to do these things, you might as well be inten intentional with it because you don't have to. So do it because it's meaningful to the stories you're kind of telling. I'm not trying to say that all this stuff is insurmountable, blah, blah, blah. But I think a lot of what I try to do with all this stuff I do is try to make things easy and simplified because a lot of the feedback I get with hex crawling is how it's difficult or how it's daunting or like, how do you do this stuff? Like, how do I fill up all this stuff? And hey, I'm saying you don't have to fill it up. Well, how do I do all this stuff? You, you don't, you know, you don't have to don't make it don't make it hard just because you feel like that's what it has to be because it doesn't have to be if you <clears throat> excuse me if you're at a point in your game mastering career where you can do it then you know do it um but if you're not then don't force yourself because you feel like this is what a hex crawl is it's got to be thousands and thousands of miles in every direction it's like it doesn't just do a little bit and I mean, I think, and this is where like to the Sh Chicago Wizards and those kinds of guys' points is you can do it in three hexes and have a whole little campaign. Like I said, for me, I find that a little bit too small because I just like to be able to look at the horizons and have an idea what's going on. But I think the point is taken, right? You don't have to have all the space. And oftentimes I don't think we're thoughtful. I don't think we're intentional with why we're doing it. We're doing it because we feel like that has to be because we've looked at the Lord of the Rings map and we feel like this is what we have to build out middle earth entire middle earth just so we can adventure around Bree instead of just building the Shire kind of thing. Uh, Brian Smith says tricky when you have to switch from procedural generation of content to specific tailored stuff, easy to set up much larger canvas and you can fill meaningfully. Yes. And this is why I do think it is good to set up your tables when you can, if you have the forethought of saying I have this area I know what's in it. Then you can set up the tables that you don't, you don't get things that you don't really want. So you're minimizing the re-rolling and stuff, and then it makes it a better tool for you. But that's a lot of work too. Setting up tables is not, not a short term. It's not a short term prospect. You don't want to do that. I think for kind of a one-off, right? You want to do it for areas that you know it. I mean, obviously here, if I was playing in this map, I don't want you know, if I was playing like, oh gosh, I'm going to want to make tables for these grasslands. I would probably even cut it up. I, I would, I would probably want to do is figure out some differences between, I don't know what the, where I would draw the lines, but I'd probably want to say like this grassland is different than this one. I don't know what this, this red line looks like. It may be a, as a political line, but you know, you know I'd want to sort of look, let's cut these up, come up with some ways. And that's another thing you can do, right? If you find yourself that you have, and it might be for a good reason, but you have a whole bunch of the terrain that's kind of the same, at least at this view, think about some ways you can kind of cut it up and think about why they're different. Why is the, this, uh, I don't know, Southwestern grasslands different than say the grasslands on the other side of the red river to the, you know, or, or, you know, what, what makes these things different? What makes these, 
<laughs> this is sharp, sharp grass and soft grass. Could be, could be right. May, maybe the giant termites are over here and the ant kegs are over here and they don't, and they fight each other, but they can't get past the river. They've decided like the, like the Portuguese and the Spanish back in the day to divide the world along the red river. And they, they take one side and the other guys take the other side. Yeah. Maybe there is something like that, or they're, they're slightly different in their, in the physically or yeah, in the flora and fauna a little bit, um, you know, but at least there you come up with some ways to differentiate it. Uh, I can't forget the dank grass. Um, but I was thinking like that other point is that even having done all of that, I think having some different terrains adds to those decision points. Cause I think they're natural spots for you to prompt your party to continue or not. Otherwise, like I said at the beginning, it's going to be a lot of, yeah, we keep going straight. Is there any, you know, is there any reason why we should change our course? I mean, there's more grasslands. Okay. We're going to keep going straight. But if you get to the woods, someone says, is there any reason why we should change our course? And I can say, well, do you want to go into the woods or do you want to try to stick to the grasslands? And then we could talk about the differences between the grasslands and the woods. Well, the woods is going to be a little bit slower. And you, you might be less detected, but you're also not going to be able to detect things as well because you're going to be out of the open for both things. Things are a little more dangerous in the woods. All this, that. Okay, do we want to go from the grasslands into the hills? Well, the hills, same things. Even more dangerous. The hills tend to be even more dangerous than the woods. Terrain's even more difficult. But but it might be faster to keep going straight and cut through the hills than it is to go all the way on the grasslands. These are all decision points. And those decision points, in a way, if your party has a purpose, if your party's just wandering, then sure, finding some, what did someone say before? Finding some, uh, I don't know, what, say, uh, what was it, scattered stones or some of those things, and keg nests, that's all fine. If you're, if you're uh, just wandering around looking for something to do, that's great. But if you're intent on getting somewhere, then all you're going to be doing is it's going to be similar to my experience in, in Into the Odd when I was just like, we're running it on all these things, but they're not really interesting things because... I don't care about the truck that spilled treacle in the street. I don't care about the uh, bureaucratic. One of them was like a bureaucratic, uh, like they'd set up basically like a toll or like a, a, a paper stop in the road. So they'd set up a, like a, 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 a roadblock where you had to show your papers, like all these things. Like, I don't care. I just want to keep going. I just want to keep going straight. And how about we just get to where we're going as opposed to bothering me with treacle trucks and papers, please. That is not, not what I wanted right what i want to do because i'm just trying to get i'm just trying to get down here all the stuff you're putting in front of me i don't care go straight go straight go straight go, go, go straight go straight but if we have terrain changes suddenly i have to think about that okay well we're, we know this bandit camp is is maybe we know a little bit about it is it in the woods maybe it is okay so it's in the woods we know we're going to go in the woods but maybe we'd be better off if we started a me win and we're now here maybe it's actually more easier to, to cut around here and try to dog this way kind of come around like i don't know terrain wise but maybe you want to stick to the high ground let's say and we don't want it because maybe this maybe this part of the forest down here is it's really dense as denoted by the the groupings of trees it's super dense maybe there's really nasty stuff so this is the most direct way but it may not be the way i want to go so now the terrain tells me that the terrain gives me a natural place to second guess myself potentially is this boat is it in the woods is this woods going to end is we're just going to go through and then you know imagine that maybe this wood stops here and there's more grassland here like ooh, is that what it is are we going the wrong way it is going to be more dangerous it is going to be slower but maybe it's the most direct way like all these comes in because of the terrain so have fun playing with all the different terrain and you don't get that in oodles of grasslands i mean you can kind of invent a few things if you want to but again i think the terrain is a much more like I don't know. To me, it's just a, a much gives a much bigger adds much more big big questions. And of course, you could play with like, do they have a player map of some kind? Where does their player map say the forest is? Now, are they wondering, are we lost? Are we not lost? This is even gives that occasion when people are wondering, well, when do I check if the party's lost? Like, here is the kind of the time where the party should be checking. Because again, if you're going for me win and you thought you were coming over this way, you're probably thinking you're not hitting any woods. You shouldn't need any woods at all maybe you'd run across them here. So if you're suddenly faced with some dense woods without any elevation changes, suddenly you're like, we're, we're not where we're supposed to be, but we don't know where in here we are. Are we just here? Are we here? Are we in, are we anywhere down this way? That's why I feel like I like it. 
Fausto says, when I zoom in at six, six meter hex, I don't do every one meter hex the same. Yeah, I, I think you can do that too. And, and if you have something like Worldographer, it can fill in those sub hex features kind of for you. It's just, it's more pressure. It's just pressure. It's uh, it's pressure to have all that. And it can also be like in Worldographer, you can get weird things when you zoom in. You have to really clean that stuff up. So if it's on the fly kind of thing, it's it can be annoying because you'll go in and you're like, oh, look, you'll see something like this. This thing of, you know, all this, and then you'll zoom in and it'll have all kinds of oddities in there. Sometimes it works all right. Sometimes you're, I'm going, whoa, and I got to go clean it up. And if you're playing kind of off the cuff in a game, you don't have a chance to clean up. You got to kind of interpret, do a little interpretive maneuvering. Malazan asks, what's a good resource? So I'm just getting into hex crawling, good rules for generating and exploration. Uh, generating, there's a bunch, Malazan. There's, uh, so there's tools like Worldographer, which is a, an application that has excellent tools for generating hexes. Uh, I don't, here's the thing though. So Malazan, there are, so there's games like World Without Number that have good just world building generation tools. And I did a whole series of videos on Worlds Without Number if you want to check into those. It has a lot of great tools for that. There's also Into the Weird and Wild, W-Y-R-D and Wild, W-I-L-D, that has lots of lots of tables and things for doing, um, for uh, different kind of sub, kind of modular systems you can add, you can pull in. I think just using the vanilla old school essentials from uh, you know the expert rules from basic expert that translate into old school essentials will work fine. Uh, I'm I think uh, Cairn I think has rules for it. It's kind of a little bit about uh, I would start with one of those just to go start start very simple on the on the rules part. The generating part I would be careful with. You can get some really great stuff. But I find myself that I end up tweaking a lot of the generating. Fausto says to check out the Outdoor Survival. Yeah, that's the Outdoor Survival is like the super classic map. Um, yeah, so Worlds Without Number has tons of tables like that for generating. I don't know if it'll generate the actual hexes for you. I would say if you want to generate a bunch of hexes and things and a lot of the apps, and there's a lot of good web apps online. I think there's a, uh, hold on, let me see if I can remember it. There is a subreddit i think it's called rpg generators let me see if it's yeah and you can see there's a whole bunch in here so if you go to i'll i'll put this i'll drop this in the chat here yeah ian says hex tml all right, drop that in the chat. It should pop up in a second. Worlds of that number. There's a bunch. It's really one of those things you're gonna try when you where you're gonna want to try out as many different things uh, as you can and see what kind of what, what what speaks what speaks to you. I don't find the random hex generators that useful for me because I tend to have an idea in my brain and I it's easier for me to get the idea out than to generate something and then have to twist and turn it for. Uh, to get what I want. And I just posted that in the chat. I'll just show it on here really quick. If you go in the chat, you can see it. It's in the, you can just go to the RPG underscore generators subreddit, and then you can just search for hex and just restrict it to that subreddit and you'll get a bunch. So there's hex TML that Ian mentioned. There's another hex generator here. Uh, you can see there's a few. Wadaboo's got some. Donjon has some hex describes. Another one, I mean, there's, there's a bunch. There's a bunch. Sometimes they'll give you a lot of stuff that you don't necessarily want. Sometimes there's, you know, they they'll give you sort of just some physical geography. Uh, if you feel like you're going to be doing a lot of work in it, I think uh, I, I think that investing in a tool like Worldographer is good. Some people like Hexkit as well. Worldographer has more GM tools kind of built in. And you can layer things, so you can have different layers of abstraction from your world map to a you know, continent level to a, several different levels. So I like that tool just in terms of, but it's a little bit clunky. I kind of, I'm kind of hoping that maybe they'll do a little UI refresh on there, sort of it streamline things a bit, but they've been adding some new features, which is cool. They actually added to their Patreon. I just saw the other day, they did some, um, some Middle Earth icons. I don't know if you can get them outside their Patreon, but it, that seemed really cool. Brian Smith that says that random generators should really be like filling a funnel. Before you play, you just kind of snap a few things together and spruce them up so there's some meaning, right? I mean, I like to have some meaning. 
I think meaning is good. I think coherence is good. So yeah, I would say use the generators, get to your get some kind of pool of ideas in here, cool, and then put them together. Yeah, so that they make sense for you. And I think that that's the biggest thing. They, they should make sense for you as a GM. Because if they don't make sense for you as the GM, how are you going to make them make sense for the party? So you got to be able to make sense of it. You got to wrap your brain around this thing that you've created, regardless of whatever tools you use to create it. Wrap your mind around it and kind of get in that mode of, okay, this is my world. And once you have your world in mind, I think a lot of things kind of will just slot together. At least they do for me. Once I understand how my world works and things are coming up, I can kind of have an idea of like, okay, this is what should happen or what I think would happen in this world. And that takes care of a lot of the work. And then I, you know, and then I can just, I can just kind of fill in with some randomness. And look, I love, I love randomness, but I want, Ultimately, I want the world to make sense. Ultimately, I want my players to be able to make decisions and say, like, well, this is what's going on, and this, or this is what's happening, this is where we are, and so this should be true. And I can go, like, yeah, I, they're they're seeing the same thing I'm seeing. And I think sometimes when you just do too much just random, you can't make that sense of it. Like that, again, that going back to that Bastion Land campaign, and nothing bad about that GM. He was a great GM, and nothing bad about Bastion Land, really, but... The way that was put together, that particular campaign was put together, that that city that we were in or whatever, it just didn't make sense to me. I'm like, things are just like nutso. Like, it was like, why would I leave my house? I would just be a shut-in in that kind of world. It's like, I can't take two steps without something like I was in Toontown. It's like, I don't want to play in Toontown. I want to get I want to get to where I'm going and go to work. And that wasn't it. Uh, Michael, hey, Michael, says, do you like giving your players a hex map, an ungridded map with low details, or make your players draw? A combination between... Uh, two or C and or, or B and C. So I don't give my players a hex map. They have no idea hexes exist. Hexes are an abstraction that's just for me to use. I, I will sometimes I will give them a starter map. Sometimes I will make a starter map prize like the first quest. Oftentimes coming into a sandbox, there'll be some kind of original sort of here's the thing to do that's going to intro you kind of into the world. And part of the intro is like your what you'll get out of it is you'll get a map or I'll make maps available. And of course there's always for sale potentially, or again, as some kind of like a reward or something they can barter for. And then also, of course, I love to have some find map fragments. That was always a great thing in the old uh, treasure. When you're rolling up random treasure is, Ooh, you got a, you got a map fragments, so all that stuff, but all this stuff will be ungraded, low detail. I make sure to explain that this is, these are not to scale necessarily. They're not going to have all the landmarks written on them, but they can be, I like to give them, Something to make them to really, it's a, a way of putting points of interest out there. I try to give things like if they're marked up, give them names or put question marks or put things that would be like explorer's notes or something on there, or how these maps were passed down or passed down from generation to generation or person to person as they've been, they've been in different people's hands who have, who have looked at them, stuff like that. I definitely don't give them uh, a hex map because I don't want them, the, I, I, I want to impress, I try to continue to impress my players. You don't have GPS. You don't have uh, surveyor's tools. You can't mark out how far you've walked with any kind of real certainty. Directions are even a little bit fuzzy. Everything is fuzzy. And I think if I give them a hex map, I, I think you, that I don't want them to have that precision. And I like the idea that they don't know they're lost until they kind of figure out they're lost. Um, you could do that with a hex map. Like you could, you know, if they're marking their progress, you could pull up their piece whatever, or have it following the wrong trail. I mean, there are different ways to do it, but I was like, no, you want to, you, you figure that out. That's kind of like dungeon mapping. It's like you, however precise you want to be, you can, you can figure that out on your end and we can have fun deciding when you have figured out you've gone off the rails, even if maybe you haven't. Um, but yeah, I would never want to give them a hex map, but I understand folks that do. It's just, a, it's kind of gives it a more of it, just changes the approach. I mean, back in the originally they did, I think everyone was playing using that outdoor survival map and everyone had was looking at the map as they're moving their pawns across. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just not the way I like to do it. Kendra says, I like the, she likes to use a hex map and layers. So they can make it look detailed and perfectly incorrect for, map for players. Yeah, at some point, I mean, at one point I had, so one of the things I did is I'd drawn a handmade map, I think in a, a, an iPad map program, and I actually had a hex overlay. And so I had my version of the map had the hex overlay, and their map version of that didn't. And I did, and I still told them like your map's not really the, you can't trust the scaling. It doesn't have a scale. You don't know how far away things are, whatever. But it was essentially it was accurate. But they didn't have a lot of the details. And then I had like a couple of layers that I had hidden when I export for them that I had for me. Um, these days I have a separate hex map and then kind of a hand drawn ish sort of map fragment for the party. But you can do <coughs> excuse me many different ways to skin that proverbial cat. All right, uh, let's see. Before I do. Anything else going on 
Ian says, talking about Michael Cross, think maps the players have should be in-world items. They shouldn't always be accurate. They should have missing items. It should involve some amount of coffee spilled on paper. Yep, I, I agree. I think they should be. I definitely think that they should be in-game items and not meta items. Now, keep in mind, I don't play with a VTT. So there's no, I'm playing on Discord with Theater of the Mind. So there's no pressure to have some kind of U, a map as UI. Uh, but even if I were, I, I don't know how I would do it, but I wouldn't do it like that. Ryan Smith says, in their little homebrew world, goblins are impulsive mappers to find their hidden caches of goods like squirrels, but very few actually understand how to make a legible or useful map. Yeah, I mean, you could see a lot of the maps in the medieval times were not particularly accurate, and a lot of them were building off of older maps. They were building off kind of hearsay, and like they were not, not super accurate. I would love to get in the habit of learning how to do maps like in that medieval style, and then those I would give out like, oh, you find this rolled up map, and it looks like one of those uh, you know, old sort of European explorer map, you know, pre-Columbus map or Columbus maps or in sort of that era in the sort of 14 or like 1200s to 15, 1600s kind of maps where they just, they, you get the basics, right? Like, yeah, the Amazon is here and yeah, but it like, and maybe even the details in the Amazon itself are fairly accurate because somebody took the time there, but then outside of it, it's like wildly inaccurate. Uh, it would be kind of fun to experiment with that. You know, it's kind of like if I have time to, to do all this stuff's great, but it's like you just you got to find time in the day to actually actually uh, do all of that. Um, it would be neat if there was some app that could take your program. I mean, that'd be a cool use of AI, right? Like a mid journey or something, you know, where you could take, you could feed it in your map and say, make this in the style of the P. Reese, P. Reese map of 1560. And it would take it and kind of, you know, mangle it all up and, and keep certain things the same and do some stuff and then spit it back out again. Well, this was an awesome Q and a session as usual. Any last thoughts before I send everybody back? If, if you, uh, if you do end up leaving early, if you give a thumbs up on your way out, that'd be awesome. If you uh, found yourself in here and you're not subscribed and you feel like subscribing, that'd also be awesome. Any last, any last things in the chat before I close her down? Let me just, let's see. Let's go into hex HTML for a minute. Oh, this one's hex HTML. All right. Well, I guess that's it. And there's a look at hex HTML. See, this is not a bad little map. So I would even shrink down this area even more, but that's just me. All right, folks. Well, have a great one. I should be back tomorrow with something. Not sure yet, but I should be back with something. Brian Smith says, having to use a specific fancy language. To read a certain map is fun too. A way to tie in languages known. Yes, I mean maps are a great way also to bring in your world building. Who made the map? What was important to them? How did they describe it? These are all things you can do to inject some of your lore into the into the into something your players see, but then make it important because the players figure out the lore, then that can tell them something about the map. Takes some thoughtfulness to do, but it, it's a way to you to kind of really engage your world building and, and put it out there in a way that actually can be meaningful to the party. Cool, folks. Well, game on, everybody, and I will talk to you later. Bye now.